Chapter 1 Identity Crisis One evening, as I pulled into the parking lot of the church where I was to speak, I noticed a bunch of young people gathered in a group outside the building, vivacious, laughing, jumping around, and having a great time together as teenagers tend to do. Their lively spirit was very appealing, and I immediately felt drawn to them. I wanted to go over and talk with them and join in with their fun for a little while. But then I noticed, off to the side, another teenager, a young lady who was by herself. Somewhat overweight and wearing thick glasses, she looked very despondent and obviously did not feel she was part of the group. All at once, my intention to join the cluster of kids was arrested when I heard the Lord say to me, Go over and speak to her. So I walked over to her, and as I approached, the Lord gave me a prophetic word for her. I said to her, Honey, God is going to give you the power and ability to write a book. Just for a moment, her eyes lit up and a great ray of hope spread across her face. Then, even as I watched, doubt like a dark cloud covered her face again, and she looked just as despondent as before. Several months later, I returned to that same church, and that same young lady met me at the front with her mother. She was elated and had in her hand a letter from the governor of the state, along with a newspaper article reporting that she had won first place in the state for a short story she had written and submitted. Now she was an integral part of the youth group, writing plays, skits, and scripts for them to perform she was starting to come into her own. By the standards of the world, and unfortunately of far too many churches and youth groups, she was not one of the beautiful people, but she was beautiful to God. Where some people might have seen a plain Jane, God saw a precious jewel with a bright and promising future, and he told her so. In a few short months, She had changed from a nobody in her own eyes to a somebody with purpose and destiny. In God's eyes, of course, she had always been a somebody. She just didn't know it. Not at least until that day when, through me, God spoke a word to her that opened her eyes to who she really was. Who do you think you are? This young lady's dilemma is not unique and is not limited to young people. Saints of all ages struggle daily with their spiritual identity. They are as mixed up as a termite in a yo-yo, tossed to and fro with no idea who they are in Christ and little or no scriptural knowledge to give them a solid foundation. Such ignorance in a child of God is not only tragic, but also dangerous. God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6a The Apostle Peter warns us to Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. 1 Peter 5, 8-9a Satan loves to pounce on immature believers who lack knowledge because if he can keep them in the dark as to who they really are, he can prevent them from fulfilling their divine destiny. God is not the author of confusion. See 1 Corinthians 14.33 He desires for us to know his plans and purposes for our lives. Satan, the accuser of the brethren and the mortal enemy of our souls, is a thief and a liar who is always busy seeking to rob believers of their true identity in Christ. Ignorance leads to bondage, while the road to freedom is paved with truth. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8.32 The first truth we need to know is the truth of who Christ is. Second, we need to know who we are in Christ. Heaven and hell are posing the same question to every person in the body of Christ. The Spirit of God and the devil alike are asking us, Who do you think you are? It is an apt question, and the eternal destiny of millions rides on the answer. 
Without question, the body of Christ today is in an identity crisis of unprecedented proportions. If we are to fulfill our spiritual destiny, we must first know who we are. But before we can discover who we are, we must comprehend who Christ is, because it is only in relation to Him that we can understand our true spiritual identity. God created us in His image, see Genesis 1.27, and has predestined all believers to be conformed to the image of His Son, Romans 8.29. But what is the image of His Son, Jesus Christ? Paul gives us the answer. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, Colossians 1.15, in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9. And God wants to make us just like Him. Even though we are made in God's image, He also made each of us unique. God delights to display Himself in our individuality. He loves diversity. Every leaf on every tree is different from every other leaf. Every snowflake is different from every other snowflake. God even gave each of us our own personal and absolutely unique set of fingerprints. There is no one else in the entire world like you. You are one of a kind by divine design. God created you to be uniquely you and endowed you with particular gifts, talents, and abilities so that you can fill your unique place in His plan and fulfill your destiny in life. No one else can do what God has called and equipped you to do. No one. Somebody said, God don't make no junk. Well, I've got news for you. God don't make no clones either. There are no copies of you anywhere in the world, and that's just the way God wants it. The world hates nonconformists. It will try to shape you into its own cookie-cutter pattern so that you look and sound and act like everybody else. Don't let that happen. You are too precious to God and too important to the body of Christ to allow your uniqueness to be squeezed out. Paul said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12.2 One modern English paraphrase of this verse really gets the idea across. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remake you so that your whole attitude of mind is changed. Thus you will prove in practice that the will of God's good, acceptable to Him, and perfect. Romans 12.2 Phillips Rejoice in who you are, the person God made you, and don't worry about trying to be somebody you were not created to be. Somebody might be saying, that may be fine for you, but I'm not an eloquent preacher or a talented musician. I can't teach, and I'm shy around people I don't know. I'm nobody special. God disagrees. The world may look at you that way, but God judges by a different standard. While the world pursues superstars, God searches for people who are hungry for Him, ordinary folks through whom He can do extraordinary things. Where the world judges by external appearances, God looks at the heart. See 1 Samuel 16.7 So if your heart is right, if you are hungry for God, He not only can use you, He wants to use you. But it won't happen unless you believe it. Until you stop listening to what the world says about you and start listening to what God says about you, you will never realize your full identity in Christ or fulfill the destiny God has for you. It all boils down to how you think, to what the Phillips translation of Romans 12.2 calls an attitude of mind. For the mind is where the battle for your destiny and mine is fought. That is why Paul insists that we must have our minds renewed, which calls for a complete transformation of our thinking. We must learn to lay aside the worldly mindset and take up the mind of Christ. See 1 Corinthians 2.16 One definition of destiny is the inner purpose of a life that can be discovered and realized. 
discovering your divine destiny and realizing accomplishing what God has called you to achieve is the most important thing you could ever do. It's what you were born for. Renewing your mind, transforming your thinking from the world's point of view to God's perspective will enable to fulfill your destiny. A renewed mind will aid you in carrying out Paul's instructions to put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Colossians 3.10 When you received Christ as your personal Savior, a great spiritual transaction took place. You received a brand new heart. At the moment of your conversion, God placed within you a changed heart, a transformed heart that made you capable of fully following His will. God says in Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36, 26 A heart of stone is a dead heart, but a heart of flesh is vibrant with life. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. In other words, as your heart goes, so goes your destiny. You can't fulfill your destiny until you know who you are. And in order to know who you are, you have to have your head on straight. Getting your head on straight In the battlefield of our minds, the devil seeks to sow evil seeds of doubt about God, his love, and his character. At the same time, he seeks to overwhelm our spirits with mind-gripping fear. The adversary of our souls is unrelenting in his attacks on God and his word. Satan's very first words to mankind, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3, was when he asked Eve, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So very subtly, Satan sowed a seed of doubt in Eve's mind that suggested that God was holding out on her. The devil continues to use that same strategy today. He casts shadows of doubt in our minds regarding the certainty of the word and the heart of God in an effort to make us think that God is not playing straight with us. The goodness and integrity of God should never be in doubt. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Nahum 1.7 O taste and see that the Lord is good, Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 37, 8 Our minds set the course and direction for our whole lives. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7a This being the case, it is vitally important that we fill our minds with the promises of God, such as Micah 3, 8. But truly I am full of the power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of justice and might and 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So what is the key to getting your head on straight? Fill your mind with the right kind of thoughts. Think about the right kind of things, as Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Philippians 4.8 My high school football coach taught me a principle to aid me in bringing down the ball carrier. The body will always follow the head. The same is true in our spiritual lives. If our minds are filled with wrong desires, we will waste our lives trying to satisfy them. On the other hand, if we set high and noble standards for thought and life, God will help us meet them because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Psalm 37, 23